Hey. Hello. Um, we have an online as well as our audience here today, so hello to the online audience too. Um, this, uh, welcome to the Meeting House, if you've not been here before. Um, this event is part of a series taking um, place this week, which is called the Common People Series, um, which is kind of celebrating, exploring, looking at kind of working class, what that means today, and particularly what that means in this area. Um, if you don't know much about this building, or maybe this is your first time, um, this is a historic building. It's over 300 years old and a place of worship, and it's kind of known for its kind of radical history and radical links. Um, but it's definitely never really had much of a working class history um, and so you can kind of think of this as a kind of working class takeover of the meeting house and trying to kind of right that wrong a little bit um, and so we've got a variety of speakers today talking about fashion and class um, and we're going to start off actually with an audio recording um, written by an American woman of colour about uh, working class and survival um, there's going to be some images on the screen and then we're going to go straight through to Eliza who is zooming in from Belfast who's going to be talking a bit about 18th century um, Irish clothing um, and then Bob and Lucas are going to join us on stage um, and going to be talking about youth subculture post-war um, so I'm gonna hand over to Stephen who's gonna play the recording the logic of stupid poor people by Tracy Macmillan Cotton we hate us and poor people First, they insist on being poor when it is so easy to not be poor. They do things like buy expensive designer belts and $2,500 luxury handbags. Errol Lewis. To be fair, this isn't about Errol Lewis. His is a belief held by many people, including lots of black people, poor people, or formerly poor people, etc. It is, I suspect, an honest expression of incredulity. If you are poor, why do you spend money on useless status symbols like handbags and belts and clothes and shoes and televisions and cars? One thing I've learned is that one person's illogical belief is another person's survival skill and nothing is more logical than trying to survive. My family is a classic black American migration family. We have rural southern roots, moved north and almost all have returned. I grew up watching my great grandmother and later my grandmother and mother use our minimal resources to help other people make ends meet. We were those good poor, the kind who live mostly within our means. We had a little luck when a male relative got extra military pay when they came home a paraplegic or used the VA to buy a Jim Walter house. If you were really blessed, when a relative died with a paid up insurance policy, you might be gifted a lump sum to buy the land that Jim Walters used as collateral to secure your home lease. That's how generational wealth happens where I'm from. Lose a leg, a part of your spine, die, and maybe you can lease to own a modular home. We had a little of, the, of that kind of rural black wealth, so we were often in a position to help folks less fortunate. But perhaps the greatest resource we had was a bit more education. We were big readers. We encouraged the girl children especially to go to, to some kind of college. Consequently, my grandmother and mother had a particular set of social resources that helped us navigate mostly white bureaucracies to our benefit. We could, as my grandfather would say, talk like white folks. We loaned that privilege out to folks a lot. I remember my mother taking a next door neighbor down to the social service agency. The elderly woman had been denied benefits to care for the granddaughter she was raising. The woman had been denied in the genteel bureaucratic way. Lots of waiting, forms and deadlines she could not quite navigate. I watched my mother put on her best Diana Ross mahogany outfit, 
a camel coloured cape with matching slacks and knee high boots. I was miffed as only an only child could be about sharing my mother's time with the neighbour girl. I must have said something about why we had to do this. Vivian fixed me with a stare as she was slipping on her pearl earrings and told me that people who can do, must do. It took half a day, but something about my mother's performance of respectable black person, her Queen's English, her mahogany outfit, her straight bob and pearl earrings got done what the elderly lady next door had not been able to get done in over a year. I learned watching my mother that there was a price we had to pay to signal to gatekeepers that we were worthy of engaging. It meant dressing well and speaking well. It might not work, it likely wouldn't work, but on the off chance that it would, you had to try it. It was unfair, but as Vivian also always said, life isn't fair, little girl. I internalised that lesson and I think it has worked out for me, if unevenly. A woman at Belk's once refused to show me a Dooney and Burke purse I was interested in buying. Vivian once made a sales girl cry after she ignored us in an empty stall. I had walked away from many of hotly desired purchases, like the impractical off-white winter coat I desperately wanted after some bigot at the counter insulted me and my mother. But I have half a PhD, and I support myself aping the white male privileged life of the mind. It's a mixed bag. Of course, the trick is you can never know the counterfactual of your life. There is no evidence of access denied. Who knows what I was not granted for not enacting the right status behaviours or, or symbols at the right time for an agreeable authority. Respectability rewards are a crapshoot, but we do what we can within the limits of the constraints imposed by a complex set of structural and social interactions designed to limit access to status, wealth and power. I do not know how much my mother spent on her camel coloured cape or knee high boots, but I know that whatever she paid it returned in hard to measure dividends. How do you put a price on the double take of a clerk at the welfare office who decides you might not be like those other trifling women in the waiting room? And perhaps an extra bit of information about completing a form that you would not have otherwise known to ask about. What is the retail value of a school principal who defers a bit more to your child because your mother's presentation of self signals that she might unleash the bureaucratic savvy of middle class parents to advocate for her child. I don't know the price of these critical engagements with organisations, gatekeepers relative to our poverty when I was growing up, but I am living proof of its investment yield. Why do poor people make stupid, illogical decisions to buy status symbols? For the same reason, all but only the most wealthy buy status symbols, I suppose. We want to belong, and not just for the psychic rewards, but belonging to one group at the right time can mean the difference between unemployment and employment. A good job as opposed to a bad job, housing or a shelter and so on. Someone mentioned on Twitter that poor people can be presentable with affordable options from Kmart, but the issue is not about being presentable. Presentable is the bare minimum of social civility. It means being clean, not smelling, wearing shirts and shoes for service and the like. Presentable as a sufficient condition for gainful dignified work or successful social interactions is a privilege 
It's the ageing white hippie who can cut the ponytail of his youthful rebellion and walk into senior management, while ageing Black Panthers can never completely outrun the effects of stigmatisation against which they were courting a revolution. Presentable is relative, and like life, it ain't fair. In contrast, acceptable is about gaining access to a limited set of rewards granted upon group membership. I cannot know exactly how often my presentation of acceptable has helped me, but I have enough feedback to know it is not inconsequential. One manager at the apartment complex where I worked while in college told me repeatedly that she knew I was okay because my little Nissan was clean, that I had worn a Jones of New York suit to the interview, really sealed the deal. She could call the suit by name because she asked me about the label in the interview. Another hiring manager at my first professional job looked me up and down in the waiting room, cataloguing my outfit. The later... The latter told me that she had decided I was too classy to be on the call center floor. It was hired, I was hired as a trainer instead. The difference meant no shift work, greater prestige, better pay, and a baseline salary for all my future employment. I have about half a dozen other stories like this. What is remarkable is not that this happened. There is empirical evidence that women and people of colour are judged by appearance differently and most harshly and more harshly than our white men. What is remarkable is that these gatekeepers told me the story. They wanted me to know how I had properly signalled that I was not a typical black or a typical woman. Two identities that in combination are almost always conflated with being poor. I sat in on an interview for a new administrative assistant once. My regional vice president was doing the hiring. A long line of mostly black and brown women applied because we were a cosmetology school. Trade schools at the margins of skilled labor in a gendered field are necessarily classed and raced. I found one candidate particularly charming. She was trying to get out of a salon because 10 hours on her feet cutting hair would average out to an hourly rate below minimum wage. A desk job with 40 set hours and medical benefits represented mobility for her. When she left, my VP turned to me and said, did you see that tank top she had on under her blouse? Oh my God. You wear a silk shell, not a tank top. Both of the women were black. The VP had constructed her job as senior management. She drove a brand new BMW because she should treat herself and liked to tell us that ours was an image business. A girl wearing cotton tank top as a shell was incompatible with BMW driving B- VPs in the image business. Gatekeeping is a complex job of managing boundaries that do not just define others, but that also define ourselves. Status symbols, silk shells, designer shoes, luxury handbags become keys to unlock these gates. If I need a job that will save my lower back, and move my baby from Medicaid to an HMO, how much should I spend signalling to people like my former VP that I will not compromise her status by opening the door to me? That candidate maybe could not afford a proper shell. I will never know, but I do know that had she gone hungry for two days to pay for it, 
or missed wages for a trip to the store to buy it, she may have been rewarded a job that could have lifted her above minimum wage. Shelves aren't designer handbags, perhaps, but a cosmetology school in a strip mall isn't a job at Bank America either. At the heart of these incredulous statements about the poor, decisions poor people make, it is a belief that we would never be like them. We would know better. We would know to save our money, excuse status symbols, cut coupons, practice puritanical sacrifice to amass a million dollars. There is a regular news story of a lunch lady who, unbeknownst to all who knew her, died rich and leaves it all to a cat or a charity or some such. Books about the modest lives of the rich like to tell us how they drive Buicks instead of BMWs. What we forget, if we ever know, is that what we know now about status and wealth creation and sacrifice are predicated on who we are, i.e. not poor. If you change the conditions of your not poor status, you change everything you know as a result of being a not poor. You have no idea what you would do if you were poor until you were poor. And not intermittently poor, or formally not poor, but born poor. Expected to be poor and treated by bureaucracies, gatekeepers and well-meaning respectability authorities as inherently poor. Then, and only then, will you understand the relative value of a ridiculous status symbol to someone who intuits that they cannot afford to not have. Um, we're just going <clears> to <throat> pass over now to Eliza. Are you ready, Eliza? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Can, is that okay? Yeah, can we you can hear? hear you. Okay. Yeah. Over to you. Okay, perfect. Can you see my slides okay? Yeah. Yeah, we can see it. Perfect. Okay. I'll just dive straight in. Um, thanks, Amy, for inviting me. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my PhD thesis findings um, in relation to working class clothing and thinking a little bit about the idea of sustainability. So my research um, investigates the dress of the lower classes in the province of Ulster, which is the most northern province in Ireland. And I'm going to share some of my findings and reflect on what we might learn from clothing practices amongst the lower classes with regards to clothing, fashion, sustainability. We tend to assume that all things improve with time, that modernity inevitably brings improvement. But what can we learn from historical clothing practices? And I just want to do a little disclaimer. First of all, sustainability with regards to clothing can be seen as a very moralizing issue of privileged people. And the point of this talk is really to get us thinking about how we can learn from the past. I don't want you to think that I'm glamorizing poverty. And um, there were significant numbers of poor people in Ireland um, for whom addressing clothing needs was sometimes very challenging. Some of the very poor sections of society had material aspirations that were beyond their reach. Um, nevertheless, disclaimer aside, there were a lot of clothing practices that were quite environmentally friendly and sustainable. And while a lot of these practices were done out of need, they were also long-standing traditions. And I think these practices are worth thinking about as we deal with the impact that clothing and textiles play on our current climate crisis. So what do I mean by sustainability? Well, sustainable fashion is a movement and process of fostering change to fashion products and the fashion system towards greater ecological integrity and social justice. Sustainable fashion concerns address the whole system of fashion, addressing the social, cultural, ecological and financial systems that are important to the production of clothing. And it's also about considering the many different stakeholders involved in the production of clothes. These include the users and producers of clothes, the living species other than humans that are affected by clothing production. And the global industry in clothing has one of the highest impacts on the planet. The big issues are the usage of water, pollution from chemical treatments used in dyeing processes, 
and the preparation and disposal of large quantities of clothing through incineration or landfill deposits. Sustainable fashion is a modern idea that has been gaining significant ground since the 1960s and traction in the last decade in particular. And of course, these ideas of sustainability were not understood in that way back in the 19th century. So I'm applying quite modern ideas on the past, which is always fraught with difficulty. But as we're encouraged to do when thinking about sustainable clothing today, um, in this talk, I'm going to take you through the whole clothing process and um, very quickly <laughs> in relation to the dress of the lower classes in Ulster. So from the manufacture of materials, the dyeing of fabrics, the manufacture of clothes, and then the recycling of textiles. So the manufacture of material can be really bad for the environment and um, from the chemicals used in the processes to the global nature of fabric produ production. So what about in 19th century Ulster? Well, industrialization was on the rise in the second half of the 19th century. Ulster and Belfast in particular played a significant part in industrial textile production, particularly of linen. And there was um, a movement from home produced materials increasingly to factory based production. However, despite the increasing availability of factory made textiles and clothing in the province, locally made or home manufactured materials made by locally known spinners and weavers were still very important. Um, much of the fabric used was homespun uh, frieze or tweeds and um, other woolens like flannel or linen or a fabric called drugget, which was a mix of linen and woolen. So here you can see some of the, the home spinning and weaving of um, homespun wool in Donegal. And this is the spinning process often done by quite young girls in the home in the domestic space to add to the family economy. And there's a huge market in this wool production in County Donegal in particular. So people with their own sheep also sent wool from their, um, from their animals to local factories and had the material woven like at this um, factory in Lisbelaw, which is in County Fermanagh. And then the webs of cloth were sent back to these families and were used to address the clothing needs of the family. So there were many different ways that a person or family could obtain materials, but a lot of cloth was manufactured in the home, the local area, or certainly within the same county that a person was from. Local textile specialists were respected for their knowledge and skills. When factories were used, they too were typically within a few counties of where some, someone lived. So the local textile market and local skills were central, where today the global market dominates. People also knew um, the names of the individuals involved in the textile manufacturing processes. Um, they may even have made uh, fabrics themselves or the, the sheep where the wool came from. So it was a very connected process. And this is something that I think we're quite disconnected from today in relation to our own clothing and what it's made from. And it's an important um, concept in sustainable thinking for the quality of a product being appropriate for the clothing item and its intended life cycle and purpose. And what's important here is that the materials were suitable for the clothing they were made for in Ulster. So while some of the homespun and local materials were quite coarse in texture, um, they were warm and durable and tended to suit the lifestyles of the wearers. And the majority of people lived um, rural lifestyles working the land. So you get a, a sort of sense of the, the people I'm talking about. So dyeing methods using chemicals can be very harmful towards the Earth's water supply and toxic chemicals can affect entire communities. So in Ulster's past, local dyes were used uh, since prehistoric times, including flora and fauna from the surrounding countryside and landscape. Traditional dyes were extracted from the roots and stems of leaves, berries, flowers of plants, as well as from insects and shellfish. And you can make a whole variety of colors. Um, yellows and reds and blues in particular were, were really common. It was usually a woman's job, but I do have some rare evidence of men here dyeing, um, dyeing wool for a Donegal homespun that I just told you about. So another um, issue we have in the clothing industry today um, is uh, that the impact is not really spread evenly across the planet. So while most of the affordable clothes and benefits of the system currently focus on the global north, much of the negative impacts affect the global south in terms of waste, pollution and ecological injustice. In the 19th century, local practices um, were important in clothing production as well. So we've moved on from the material and we're now onto the garment construction. 
Um, and again, it's a creation and construction was usually within a 30 mile radius from where a person lived, actually usually within five miles. And a lot of clothing um, worn in rural Ulster in particular was made bespoke. And today we think of bespoke made or made to measure clothing as something associated with Savile Row tailors or couture design. Or you might think of dressmakers and tailors, but you probably associate it with something that costs a lot of money um, and that would be out of the financial reaches of most people. But this wasn't the case in the past. And women, of course, made a lot of clothing for their families and dressmakers and tailors were hired working from their own homes or from a fixed place of business. But additionally, up to the First World War, there were traveling tailors and shoemakers as well who moved around the Irish countryside making clothing and footwear by hand in the homes of lower class people. And they produced trousers, suits and outerwear for men and boys from the time that a boy got his first pair of trousers, which could be anywhere between the ages of six and 13. They were really respected for the quality of the work they produced. And it was considered that while there were some in, inevitably that had more skill than others, they generally produced garments of a superior quality than could be acquired from other sources for the same price. And of increasing concern today is the impact of clothing production on other people and labor rights. We've seen much evidence in the news of countries where there are a few labor rights exploiting workers with poor wages and dangerous working conditions in clothing production. But with these um, makers and producers in, in the past, um, they were respected for their skills and knowledge. They were known by name. They were invited into the homes of their, their customers. There was a lot of cooperation in terms of payment. So they, they received payment in kind or paid a daily rate and they were fed and clothed um, during their stay. So there was a lot of locally understood fair treatment and cooperation amongst social equals. And this is the kind of materials they were using. Again, a lot of locally made and locally um, available materials. So the impact of clothing on the environment is in twine with how much and how long clothing is used for. Part of the issue is around us not considering clothing and textiles to be a value and worth preserving. The poor quality of uh, fabrics used, the frequency with which fashion collections are created, increased material expectations where we, we all expect to have wardrobes full of clothes that we replace regularly, and the cheapness of poor quality clothing. A clothing item worn daily over many years has a lot less of an impact than a clothing item used once that is quickly discarded. But in the past, there was a much slower impact of fashions and trends amongst the lower classes in Ulster, and there are incredibly long-standing traditions in addition to that, there was a huge market in cast off clothing, which has much less of an environmental impact than the creation of new clothes. A large proportion of cast offs were sold on the streets, on stalls at markets and fairs in towns, but particularly throughout the countryside. There were also a large numbers of shops in urban areas selling cast off clothing. Much of it was imported from Britain um, into Ireland. Glasgow was a source of a lot of the cast off clothing sold through Belfast. And Irish people also became involved in the cast off clothing trade in um, Britain after the famine. They largely supplanted Jewish traders in the secondhand trade in London. And um, nevertheless, excuse me, Jewish businesses in London, such as the old um, clothes exchange in Cutler Street, sold um, large dealers lots of clothing which were um, exported to Ireland in particular. So we basically received a lot of the cast off clothing that wouldn't sell in, in Britain. <laughs> um, so here there's um, some some shops in Dublin, um, Coles Lane Market was a huge uh, centre of the cast of trade in that city, as was Patrick Street, it was a rag, a rag fair um, in the centre of the city. And this is in Belfast, this is Smithfield Old Coles Market, which is in the city centre still today. Um, and it's depicted a lot in photographs and in, in paintings of the 19th and early 20th century. And this is a, a rural fair in, in County Mayo. So a lot of this secondhand clothing was auctioned off to rural customers as well. And peddlers um, walked the land, circulated on foot and sometimes um, using horse and cart or vans selling um, secondhand clothing to people at their doors. So there's a whole trade, like a networked industry in this uh, secondhand clothing. And increasingly then they moved to transportation like uh, vans and cars. So it's been estimated that only 20% of clothing today is recycled or reused and huge amounts ends up in landfill. 
But in the past, there was a, a lot of textile recycling and repurposing of clothing in the home. So how older clothing was reused depended on its quality and condition, as well as the financial circumstances of the family. Old clothing was passed on to friends, family or neighbours. Sorry, I can hear a wee bit of feedback there from someone who's been, maybe their microphone is on. Um, sorry, so old clothing was passed on to friends, family or neighbours and specific clothing items were associated with meaning and had value. And so they were typically handed down from an older to a younger family member. So this issue of material and emotional value is very important today as well as in the past. So if clothing is of a low quality and the items deteriorate quickly, then it's unlikely that they'll become connected with emotional bonds that help to ensure a person looks after the garment and keeps the item of clothing longer. While poorer people in the past had few options other than to keep and care for their possessions, they also applied meaning to clothes and ensured it cultivated emotional durability. Cloaks and decorative shawls um, in particular were examples of this. They were highly prized items that were cared for and passed along maternal family lines. But in other forms of textile recycling, clothing, clothing was adapted and altered for reuse in the domestic space. And um, so if it was no longer wearable, it might be used for patching and the repair of other clothes. But it was also used um, in patchwork quilts and there was a very strong patchwork quilting tradition in Ulster, which um, was a big social activity amongst women. And if they could not be used in um, quilts, then they were used for rag rugs in the home. And this was done also in Britain as well. So nothing was wasted is what I'm saying. So the final part of my talk is about the rag trade. So today we have quite a focus on the concept of reduce, reuse and recycle, um, which pushes responsibility um, on the individual. And the concept is really about individualism and consumerism with clothing. We're also seeing a lot of attention on the reuse of materials that have been considered as waste, as a more sustainable way of making new clothing. So essentially recycling old fabric into new materials for clothes. And this is interesting because this happened in the past. There was a whole industry that focused on the recycling of textiles, which took pressure off the individual and put it back on industry, where I think it also belongs. Um, material that had become rags and could no longer be used in the home for the quilts or the rag rugs that I just described could be sold or exchanged with rag men or tatters, as they were sometimes called, who travelled the countryside, often on foot, to gather rags for sale um, in the textile, in, uh, trade, textile recycling trade in Britain. All textile materials, with the exception of silk, could be recycled by the middle of the 19th century. Um, it was the shoddy industry in particular which revolutionised textile recycling. Um, shoddy was a fabric made from the shredded fibre of waste woolen cloth and old woolen rags, um, and it was focused as an industry in West Yorkshire. The recycling and reuse of textiles in this way and the extensive nature of the rag trade demonstrates the significant value that clothing and textiles had. Really nothing was wasted, and this is the origins of the word shoddy. Um, if anyone's making that connection in their head to say something is shoddy or of inferior quality, it's referring to this material. And that's what it looks like on the right hand side. So just to conclude, um, the lower classes in Ulster um, knew where their clothing came from, and even sometimes the very person who manufactured their clothing items. And this is what I call having strong material literacy. They understood their clothing. There is evidence of a lot of sustainable practices and um, people tended to buy the best of what they could afford, what they needed, and it was often acquired locally. By looking at clothing in the past, I hope you can see that we can learn a lot about social history, but also reflect on some material strategies that make us think a bit more about our uh, practices in the present. And um, frugality allowed people to be very resourceful and innovative uh, and ensured that people were more respectful of their clothing, I believe. Um, learning from the past can certainly help us reflect on our present. Um, thank you for listening. Eliza, thank you. That was fascinating. Um, and I think we all learn a lot. It's an, an absolutely fascinating to take something historical. It's so relevant to today in, in lots of different ways. Thank you. Um, I wonder if we might maybe ask questions from the audience to Eliza now, because I know we started late and I don't want to expect you to kind of hang around. So does anyone have any questions for Eliza now before we go to our next speakers? I won't force it, but I'm just wondering, because I don't feel like I 
can't ask Eliza to stay um, later than the time that I told her that she would be on till. It's not, it's not a question, I just want to say it was really interesting and like you kind of don't realise how important, well you don't really think about fashion in that sense as like, like I don't know, you don't realise how important it is always and like you don't think about it in terms of history, but well, I never really did until, yeah, until I started studying, but yeah, it's really interesting, really great topic. Yeah. Thank you. I'm coming. David, I suppose it's kind of hopeful in a way too. I mean, Eliza, I don't know if that was intentional. That um, that you know, with fast fashion and and you know, climate change and the climate crisis, it's obviously uh, you know we need to make urgent. Well, we should have made urgent change a long time ago. But um, that maybe in your message, there's a little bit of hope at the end there. That you know, these these processes existed, and maybe we can go back to that. Yeah, absolutely. I am. I do live in eternal hope that we'll learn some lessons from our past. I think there is a lot of the seeds of things, you know, that we can get back to. The shoddy industry, for example, only ended about 10 or 15 years ago, which is such a shame. We had all these skills and this knowledge and expertise in Yorkshire, for example. Um, and there are still people that have all these textile manufacturing skills throughout the whole of Britain and Ireland. There's a you know, huge textile knowledge, especially in, in the north of England, of course, um, and in the north of Ireland as well. And so it's not too late to kind of reclaim those skills and, and make sure that's preserved. Um, and certainly we can not always think that everything gets better with time. I don't think that um, it does. Now, I would say that having greater sort of democratic access to, to clothing is, is a good thing on the one hand, you know, that um, more people can afford clothing now is great. In the past, it was probably the most expensive thing that most people owned. But what I, I think is good about that is people understood its value. Now we expect clothes to be cheap um, and we're disconnected from how expensive it was previously. And if your clothes are cheap, then that usually that means somebody has been affected negatively in the process of that its manufacture. It just might not be that we see those people. They're maybe in a different country on the other side of, of the globe. You know, we we don't see it, but somebody suffers when our clothes are cheap. What I, where I sit with it is um, if we buy the best that we personally can afford and we respect its value and we look after it and we understand the processes and that's the best an individual can do because we have uh, different financial capacities and one person's good quality and what they the best they can afford is very different and so that's the best way we can stop moralizing um, people's decisions you know because it clothing um can present really big challenges for people but it is something that unifies us everybody needs clothing because we live in a society that expects us to dress our bodies and whether we think that's good or not that's a different question and um, but it's one of the three things we all need right shelter food and clothing um is part of what's helped humans evolve <laughs> um evolution that's a whole other clothing and evolution is a whole other topic but it's something we all need and it's something that unifies us so i think it's something we can all um think about more um the choices that we make just even to think about where it comes from is a first step in understanding those processes. And I think that we've lacked, we lack material literacy in the way that people had in the past. And um, more people in society understood clothing, just the way you can read a book, they could read clothes and they could read textiles and they knew what was good quality and the best quality they, they could as, aspire to with their financial capacity. Uh, and I think that's something we're missing now, generally. Uh, fascinating history and I enjoyed it very much. I mean, um, does the history show the rural population adapting to an increasingly industrialized uh, world that is uh, basically taking away their autonomy as a rural people who, could, who would be able to manufacture and also create their own uh, economic system and with um, the issue of environmentalism and uh, people going back into small businesses, would it work again, especially with the new types of fabrics and new materials that make clothing much cheaper, but also new ways of making clothing uh, 
less likely to make it possible for people to be able to repair or or make or actually salvage clothing so that it could be reused again yeah so i think to answer the first part of your question there um rural society yes so there was a huge breakdown especially in britain now i study ireland where the only part of the island that was really industrializing was around Belfast and in the northeast of the province and um, the rest of the island remained overwhelmingly rural right into the 20th century. So these practices of home-based manufacturing textiles lasted longer in Ireland than they did in Britain and um, so some patterns that changed in Britain at the end of the 18th century were still um, happening in Ireland into the early 20th century. It, it's at a different pace of change. Um, so where in Britain, by the end of the 19th century, about 70% of the population were now urban, living in industrial areas. It was like the opposite pattern <laughs> in, in Ireland. And so it was really in, in Belfast and the counties of like Antrim, Down, Armagh, around the Northeast, where that you could definitely say that they were, these skills were becoming much more factory based and people having less skill in the home. But even into the 1960s in parts of Ireland, um, this domestic textile production was still happening. Um, in relation to Donegal Tweed that I mentioned, that process was only mechanized in the 1960s. So they were still spinning on wheels. Um, the urban, the sort of, sorry, the Western seaboard remained very rural and only connected to electricity in the late 1960s. And these textile processes only happening in the 1960s. And that's partly about rural poverty. Um, so there was a slower loss of that, that knowledge and a slower loss of that skill than would have happened in Britain. And then the second part of your question is about, yeah, the, the loss of skills um, for people to repair their clothes. Yes, so I think a large part of this is around education. So in the 19th century, um, in 1831, a school system was established in Ireland called the National School System of Education, and it was designed for the education of poorer children. And it was free, supposedly non-denominational education, but in Ireland that, that didn't happen. Um, everything was um, done in a, in a sort of very denominational way, but the curriculum was across the board in relation to sewing and needlework skills. So girls learned a very extensive um, sort of uh, lesson plan all around how to make and mend clothes and to repair, to darn. And um, now this was partly designed to get them um, jobs in domestic service where those skills would be needed. Also to provide them with skills for emigration, which was a very common experience for Irish girls in the 19th century. But also those skills could be used in the textile industries, especially in the Northeast, and put to use in the home. So there was a very strong knowledge amongst um, girls and women, um, and they had extensive repairing and darning um, skills. And now actually in schools, um, to, you know, it's usually in home economics, um, and I would like those skills not to be gendered, I should say, but in the 19th century, they really were. Um, but now often you don't learn any of those skills unless you happen to take up a craft or you take interest. Um, some schools teach it, other schools don't, you know, so um, where it was very extensive in the education um, in the past, uh, that's not the case anymore. Thanks for the great question, David, and thanks for that fantastic answer. Eliza, we won't keep you any longer, but thank you so much for joining us all the way from where you are. Um, and uh, we are going to pass over now to Lucas and Bob. Um, if you want to... So the whole idea of this is, is that I'll give a bit of a history lesson, if you like, of working class subcultures throughout the decades. And then after I do my bit, I'm going to go up to about the early 1970s and then I'll pass over to Bob. Um, just a little bit about me, so I run a, a vintage clothing business which is called Monty Lee's Vintage. Um, I'm absolutely obsessed with 60s clothing, I have a big archive of it, I collect pretty much everything I possibly can, um, then I buy and sell particularly to people in subcultures essentially. Um, and a bit of Bob's background is that he's a long-standing friend and he's been into the mod culture for a long time and also did quite a few other things around it. So hence why it's going to be nice to go through all the decades and then transition on to Bob after that. Um, so if you go to the next slide. Um, 
the first subculture I'm going to talk about um, is Teddy Boys. So a lot of people don't really know how significant the Teddy Boy era was um, during the 1950s. Um, it was the first real time that you had teenage youth cultures. So before this, what you had was, I don't know how much everyone knows about the history, but um, what you had was national service around at the time. So most young lads, when they got to the age of 18, they'd be straightway drafted into the military, and this is a carryover from the Second World War. Um, and this lasted right the way up until, I think it was about 1958. So, and there's a big, big shift from them to, to when the, the guys afterwards who came along, like there's a massive shift between the personality types and the culture types and all that sort of thing. So an example I've got is my grandfather, he did his national service. He was a miserable old bugger, to be completely frank. Um, he was very, very regimented. I loved him to bits, but he was very, very regimented. Um, everything was prim and proper. Up until the day he died, he wore brown Oxfords and you know flannel trousers and a blazer, and that was pretty much all he had. Um, and I remember him always saying to me, "I remember when the Teddy Boys came along; they were awful. They were horrible people. They weren't, but you know, it's the, the way that they perceived them in a way. I suppose they had a uh, Teddy Boys. Uh, they what they concentrated on, or what they went for, was almost like an Edwardian dress form." Um, I used to wear long drape jackets, used to wear bootlace ties, um, and it was always yeah, they had high collars and all that sort of thing, drain pipe trousers, and big, big, chunky Oxford shoes. Um, and probably the famous one is brothel creepers. So the guys who came along and did that, it was m massively inspired by rock and roll music that came along at the time. So um, I'm going to give an example. My, my girlfriend, Kate, who actually put the slides together, her grandfather um, was an original teddy boy in Maidstone. Um, quite hard to find people in London to talk about this because most of them have passed away now, unfortunately. Um, but Kate's granddad, Ron, um, the, the amount of difference between my grandfather and Ron is absolutely unbelievable. So Ron was born, I think it was, was it a week after, after National Service cut-off date? So, so his, his birth date was a week after the National Service cut-off date. So when he... When he No, but the cut-off date, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But anyway, there was, yeah, there was a cut-off date before we got to 18, and then the law changed, and you didn't have to do national service anymore. Um, Ron's, how do I put it? He's, a, he's a, a lot more like a teenager, and still to this day, to a certain extent, him and his wife Mandy, they're both pretty much exactly the same. So he used to go down to um, was it the Royal Star Arcade in Maidstone, which is where, where used to be a famous um, club back in his day, Big Ballroom. Um, and where they used to listen to people like Bill Haley, um, Little Richard, Chuck, Chuck Berry, all these American influences coming through, so they were taking a lot of that music. But the, the dress really stayed, it harked back to the past in a way. Um, they were, as I said, they, they were quite well known for being quite intimidating, really. You know, people who were of the generation beforehand, even though there was a very, very close, you know, they were, it wasn't far apart, um, were completely and utterly, they, they hated them. To be frank, my granddad wouldn't, he, he used to slag them off like you wouldn't believe. So, but it was the first time that you had teenagers starting to make that impression on older people, and particularly in the working classes. Um, the press hated them. Um, they used to make big newspaper reels about them, saying, Teddy Boy's, you know, going and fighting here and stabbing people here and all that sort of thing. So, much like today, in a, in a way. Um, you could change over the slides for that. So there's a few pictures of, of, of the chaps. I believe the, the picture on the right is from a famous photo set, which is actually in Kilburn. And you can see just how, I think this is more of a later um, 50s photo, that one, because you can start seeing slim tyres and everything come through. So it started tr transitioning on by that point. But towards the left, you had the traditional sort of Edwardian look, which was more of like a mid-50s thing. So moving on to the next slide. So... This is the, the subculture that I'm most associated with, and Bob is to an extent as well, I'd say. Um, so the mod subculture, um, you could say it evolved out of Teddy Boy to a certain extent. Um, obviously, it was a younger generation again, but this was the, it, what was important about it, it was the first proper forward-thinking subculture that existed. So Harold Macmillan quite famously said, 
um, in, I think it was 1960, that they've never had it so good. And what he was talking about is teenagers at the time and the way that the economy was turning. So where before you had rationing and poverty, which is what the teddy boys had to go through, um, suddenly you had kids who could go out and buy things on high purchase and spend a lot of money on it. A lot of them were going and getting jobs quite easily. So I've got accounts of original mods saying to me, we could literally walk out of one job and tell the governor to stick it and then walk into the job the next day and pretty much be told to start work. They had no problems with it. So they were, they were very affluent, you know, a lot of them, their dads who had done national service and everything, funnily enough, um, had been earning, you know, five pound a week forever and they were stuck in dead end jobs, manual labor. A lot of these chaps were going into the city and some of them were stockbrokers earning 20 pound a week, which is quite significant when you're paying your mum three pound a week keep. Um, so that's, if you talk about equivalent, so five pound a week is probably the average wage of what today is, so maybe something like 20,000 pound. These guys were earning 50, 60. So it's a massive step up when you consider how old they were. And these are 16, 17 year old lads, a lot of them, and girls as well, who, again, um, girl, it was the first time girls were starting to go out and get jobs on their own as well. So you wanna roll the slide over? So I wanted to try and include as much as possible into, you know, getting all aspects of it. So um, the guys at the top left of the photo, um, they're actually, that's, I think that photo was taken on Commercial Road. So they were East London mods originally. Um, the chaps in the bottom left, that's all the old South East London mob. So they're all from round about the Elephant and Castle. Um, girls in the middle, I'm not too sure they're from, but um, as a, like a sort of typical mod girl look at the time. So um, where... A, a lot of, early on, a lot of the chaps were going and getting tailored clothes, um, referring almost back to what the lady before said. So there was a hell of a lot of tailors in London at that time. You had a lot of Jewish tailors around um, who would be able to put stuff out at massively high quality for very little cost. And because you had higher purchase, um, you could go out and get something on the tip with most of them. And a lot of the chaps were having sort of five suits a year made, which is a huge amount considering beforehand it'd be one a year that you'd probably get on your birthday um, and they were getting getting stuff made out of amazing materials like mohair um, mohair wool cloths which were basically like a shiny ir iridescent fabric so as you walked along the street it would literally the, the light would be moffy and sometimes they had two-tone weaves so it would change color as you walked along um, which was very heavily inspired by a lot of the the Motown artists who were around at the time um, which was a, a very heavy music influence for them, um, and who were obviously known for wearing these massively bright colours. So these guys really stood out. Um, a little bit later on, it started to develop into casual wear, which I'm sure Bob will probably take down a, a, a lane a little bit later on, but it, it became a little bit more mass-produced, I'd say. So you almost had three generations of mod throughout the 60s. So you had the very early guys who um, most people think of winkle pickers and sort of having brill creamed hair and wearing these very, very short bum freezer jackets. Later on, it started to become a bit more, um, so they'd wear more English cut suits. Um, and then later on again, it started to go into casual wear. So it was like three different generations. I know original mods who were around in sort of 1960, 61, um, who would say, oh, the guys in 1964, 65, they weren't bloody mods. I don't know what they are. They were completely, it wasn't completely different. They were still obsessed with clothing and constantly changing their look, but they evolved into casual wear. And that's probably what everyone associates with them with nowadays because they were notorious for going down to Brighton and beating people up. So the girls in the middle, they're wearing a, a more casual look. So they're wearing, um, one, of the, one of the rights wearing a quilted anorak, which was the sort of thing you could go and buy from St. Michael in Marks and Spencer for very cheap back in the day, um, but it's a very modern look, so it's taken from like, the skiing look, and they're wearing ski pants and little loafers. Um, the girl look was quite an androgynous look, which was a standout thing at the time. So the girls tended to wear a lot of blokes clothing. So they'd wear you know, their boyfriend's shirts, they'd wear trousers, which was a massive no-no. Um, you couldn't walk into a private members club wearing a pair of trousers back then. So they really, really looked like they stood out. Um, and turned a lot of heads of people who didn't really like them that much. Um, and I suppose what's the, the, the last image of, of mods back in the 60s is riding motor scooters as well. So again, we're going back to higher purchase, um, for the first time, young lads and, and ladies as well used to be able to go out and afford to buy their own transport. Um, you've got to bear in mind back in the early 60s, you could 
having owning a car was a majorly, majorly affluent thing. So nowadays, uh, you know, the average household ownership of a car is, I think, two, two and a half. Back then, it was half. So one in every two households would own a car. You know, it'd probably be your dad. So owning an Italian motor scooter back then was really different. And it especially stood out considering your dad would have had a British motorbike with a sidecar probably as well. So they took a lot of influences from continental styling and also from America as well. And it was the first generation to really do that. And they, it, today, if you see a mod look, a lot of people wouldn't be able to recognise it from modern clothing. So it's probably one of the most referred back to clothing style today. So next slide. Um, just wanted to stick a thing I thought was really important as well to really express just how inclusive mod was as well. So the, uh, the, I've, I've included at the bottom left of the picture there, there's a, a picture of a Chinese chap who lived in South East London. I don't actually know the name of him, but it's, a, it's quite a well-known and circulated photograph. Um, they include, for, because of the continental influences, it was the first time that race didn't become a part of it. So, you know, a lot of the guys in the early 60s, as you probably know, you had the, the you know, the Windrush generation come in. Um, a, there's a lot more immigration coming in. Um, and Mod sort of embraced it a bit more. I'm not saying that racism didn't exist, no way. But I think it was the first time you started to have that inclusion and you really didn't have that before. So, um, someone you probably all know, there's a picture of Twiggy in the, in the middle there. So before she became a famous supermodel, so she was a mod. Next slide. There's more photos. Um, the, the bottom right is a, a photograph of a more casual look that people started to wear towards the mid-60s. So, and then about the bottom left photo is a picture of um, Ready Steady Go. So Ready Steady Go was, it, during the mid-60s was the equivalent of Top of the Pops. So um, you'd have, funnily enough, you'd have Dutty Springfield, um, if, I don't know if anybody knows what you're renowned for a big blonde bouffant and heavy eye makeup. Um, she she was uh, featured in a TV program, and what she was asked to do was go out and reach out to the younger audiences. And it was a, it was on a Friday evening um, at six o'clock, and they were drafting all these American acts to come along. And what they used to do is they used to go around to all the the local nightclubs and everything. Um, and they used to literally tap people on the shoulder to tell them they were a good dancer, and then they'd get a free ticket to Ready Steady Go, and you'd actually appear in the, in the programme itself. And what a lot of the northern mods and people outside of London who couldn't afford to come to the clubs here used to do is they actually used to watch the kids in London to work out exactly how they used to dress and how they used to dance. But the funny thing was, if they used to come to London to, like a, a couple of weeks later with this new clothing that they've had done, the fashion was so fast changing that you'd instantly be able to recognise that they weren't from London at that point. So <laughs> they'd be dressed completely differently and people would be taking the piss at you, frankly. So, next slide. So, in the, after, after the big, the Brighton beach battles, if you like, in 1964, which everybody remembers Mod for, um, Mod really started to evolve and it split. Um, and it sort of split down the middle of between the working class kids who are into it and the middle class kids who are into it. So the middle class went off to do, basic, they, what they started to do is they started to get into a more flowery sort of look, a more soft look. They started wearing louder colours. And the traditional image of 1966, 1967 Carnaby Street is what I'm trying to go down the route now. That, that's where the middle class kids started to go. So they were a little bit more affluent. They could afford things which were out of this world, they'd go to places like John Stephen and Carnaby Street, which was a very, very famous, um, famous shop at the time, and they'd pick up unbelievable flowery and paisley and pinks and all sorts of things that men would not be worn before. There's quite a famous video um, of an interviewer going around uh, the King's Road at the time, um, going and basically picking off all of these city gents who were walking along in their you know, bowler hats and canes and that traditional look. And going, well, what, so what do you think of all these young people? And they're going, I think it's disgusting, personally, all these girls wearing miniskirts. Um, so they completely went off on a tangent. Next slide. So there's a bit of an idea. You could just see how colourful all of the clothing was back then. Um, there, there was some working class kids who went down that route, but they were more the ones who got into music and probably went down the, 
became musicians. So you had famous bands like the Small Faces, for example, um, who are very notorious for have chased that look a little bit later on. Next slide. Working class kids, however, on the, the local estates and everything, they used to, they weren't really into that look as much because it was considered to be a little bit camp. So they, a lot of them became skinheads. So most people nowadays associate skinheads with the mid 1980s and the NF and racism. I'm not talking about them, I'm talking about the late 60s and early 70s kids. So the look actually started because of a lot of the West Indies kids coming in. So most of the early skinheads were actually black lads. Um, they were into ska music, um, calypso music, and they brought it over. And a lot of the the mod kids who were around in the you know the latest part of the 60s, who were the younger brothers of you know the more smart ones, they started to really latch on to that Jamaican sound and that Jamaican look. So what you'd find is kids would start wearing button-down shirts with braces, and they'd start wearing um, wider-cut trousers, boots, for example, like Doc Martens. Most people who recognise nowadays. Um, and it was, and they started to wear, you know, blue beat hats and cut their hair a little bit shorter. So, a lot of people call it hard mod nowadays, which I, I don't really agree with the term of. But it's it, it's that progression into skinhead is what people try and write about today. So next slide. Yeah, hard mod. So hard mod um, is it's a modern term that they've come up with recently, um, in my opinion. Anyway, that's what, from what I can see. Um, it's basically describing the, the transition between mod and skinhead because it's a very, very similar look. So if you, if you look at what the mid-60s mods were doing and then you look at what skinheads were doing, they started to put, it, it was a very close, close time. So a lot of the guys I know who were mods in sort of 66, 67 started wearing braces and hobnail boots. Um, they would describe themselves as mods. But nowadays, if people who write books about subcultures would call them skinheads most, most likely. So it's just that, that transition. So, Kate? Yeah. yeah. So uh, another term that Kate just pointed out to me, I should uh, put this out as well. So a lot of people nowadays as well talk about what suede head. Um, suede head uh, is basically a way of describing late 60s skinheads in a way because they, they didn't actually have their head completely shaved. Hair completely shaved. They had tended to have um, like a, a short grey two crop with a, like a, a line cut into it as a parting. So, and most people think of that as that they call it suede head nowadays. But it's all part of the same thing anyway. So it, it, it was. I, I look at it that it's uh, an age thing as well. So the mods that were like in their teens in '63, by the time you get to '66, '67 and 69, they were married. You, you, mo most young men were married by the time they were 21 and, and young women. So that first generation of mods from the early 60s through to the mid 60s, by the time they, they get to the later 60s, they were, they, were, they were married and they weren't on the scene anymore. But these younger lads, that were getting the sort of second hand army downs, they were getting like them button down shirts and the mohair jackets as well. It is a separate, it was a separate thing, but the way it developed, it was a, an, a, against the long hair and the peace and love of the hippies, which was a very middle class, uh, which was a very new middle class subculture. And it moved away. It, so they was, they was in the ska, reggae, and Motown. And, and they, you know, they were listening to older music even then in the late 60s. And that's how the, and the look developed out of that. And even that, as soon as it caught on, like most, most of these cultures we talk about, as soon as they caught, up, caught on, they started growing their hair and they become suede heads and got yeah. longer hair and boot Basically, boys. Yeah, and you had a lot of, uh, funnily enough, a lot of people associate like the modern skinhead look with, uh, with Lambrette scooters and everything. But a lot of those guys were growing their hair longer. They started to get into glam rock as well, which is yeah. an, another interesting spin off. And they started to go down like the Easy Rider look. I don't know if anyone's seen the Easy Rider, but they quite famously ride these big Harley Davidson choppers and ride around America causing trouble and running drugs around. But, we won't talk about the drug side of things. Um, but you can see that I've, I've, I've tried as hard as possible to try and get some of the pictures of, you know, some of the, 
some of the, the black lads who were involved with it because I think they are the real foundations of it. And it, skinheads today who are into the late 60s look are really struggling to try and pull that, um, try and completely discard the, the, like the racist element of it. So I think it's really important to, to make a point of it. Um, another thing as well is that a lot of the kids, they started to go, to go to football as well. So it was the first generation of teenagers who really made a point of basically becoming football hooligans. So a little bit later on in the 80s, it was probably a little bit more re renowned. Um, but the skinheads, they used to have their own little football firm. So you had a lot, uh, quite famously, the Chelsea skins um, was a big thing in the early 70s. And there's a lot of photographs out there of Bobby's pulling um, a, lot, a lot of the young skinhead lads out of crowd because they'd been a bit naughty at the time. So, but that's essentially that um, for that, that my side of the subculture scene. I think it's important now to hand over to Bob because mid 70s after the skinhead scene was really where Bob comes in when it started evolving into punk and later on. So, Bob. Thanks, Logan. Um, yeah, so I, I, was a, I was a teenager, uh, a bit too. Uh, a bit too young for punk rock. Um, this is a video I took in 1982. So this is sort of, this is our, all the East London on a day out in uh, Carnaby Street, looking for skinheads where he didn't find any. Um, it, it's like what Lucas said, it was uh, all of these subcultures were very, very working class and very, very teenage based. In my opinion, this was, where we come into the late 70s, I mean, post-punk, punk was it a bit of an anomaly because they were a little bit older and uh, they were mostly middle class. So the most of the leading punks, you know, Strummer, you know, they were from the home counties and uh, a little bit bit older than the, than the audience, funny enough. The audience is very punk. I come from East London, uh, brought up in Forest Gate, uh, family's from Bow, and, um, didn't know any punks. So like 77 was a bit of a wasteland. Loved the music, but there weren't really anyone walking around uh, contrary to what you see on films. And uh, there weren't really people walking around with Moe Egan's. And, uh, you know, I went to see the Jam, Buzzcocks, uh, never see the Pistols, obviously I was too young. But um, you go and see them bands and there was mostly blokes just in ripped up postman's jackets and things like that with a safety pin in and short hair and and straight straight jeans i mean 78 77 78 it was really hard to get straight jeans because everyone was wearing flares it was still you know left over from the mid 70s so it was quite hard to find um decent trousers and decent clubber but we was always looking and that, that i think that's the thing with uh with these youth cultures is the obsession with clothes and music and the way you look and the way you are. Our, a lot of our style come from the football terraces, that Saturday was our day. I mean, Saturday was a young te teenage boy's day out. You know, you had no, you know, apart from police chasing, you, you had no adult supervision. You were out of school Friday at 12, 13. Uh, you were out of school Friday, you was already talking about at lunchtime going to the game or like a little bit later when we were about 14, 15, going to away games. And and when you were there, you were, you know, you were in a, a crowd of, I'm West Ham, so uh, 45,000 at Upton Park, probably 15,000 teenagers. So if you're in a crowd of 15,000 teenagers, you're going to be looking at what people are wearing. You're going to be looking at what's cool, what the big boys are wearing. That was our thing, you know what I mean? The lads, we, we, you know, we started on the North Bank and then progressed to the South Bank and what the lads were wearing at, at the, towards the back of the ground, they were the tougher lads. They were closer to the away firms so they could, they could get to the away supporters, get through the old bill and get to the away supporters. And, I, I, you know, I was lucky really. I mean, it was... Skinhead was massive. There was a skinhead revival in the sort of mid to late 70s. And a bit on the back of punk rock, 
Um, but they were really racist. They were all to a man, NF, and we had another thing called the BMP, which people have forgotten about, but they was like radical right-wing version of the NF, <laughs> if that, you know, if that existed. And most of our, you know, a lot of our mates, we were a mixed race, we were a mixed race gang. So most of our mates, you know, probably 40, 40 60 uh, black kids, you know, and it's because, you know, the black kids were tougher and the, the, you know they were tougher and they was into music and clothes and so were we so we all sort of hung, hung together and we lived next door we lived cheap by jail so you know it it was a it was definitely a no-no to be a skinhead and i was searching i was looking for something i wanted an identity i didn't want to be like my brothers and just be normal i wanted something different so i choose i chose this mod thing and um mate of mine was a year older used to go gigs with him, Paul. He took me in the school holidays. I got a bit of money. We'd done some jobs. We was working. Uh, we was 14. Yeah. We was doing like uh, making out, signing up for um, doing dishwashing and things like that for an agency, making out we was 18. And so we had some money. And he, he said, oh, I'll take your Mints and Davis in Romford. And I bought two pairs of Stay Press, Levi Stay Press, light blue pair and a beige pair. Uh, and a parker, and I already had a couple of button downs and a Fred Perry, and that was it. I come back to school, and I was a mod, and that, that's that was it. That <laughs> was all. So all my gear was all ready, and uh, it stuck with me, and it's you know I'm still influenced by it to, by it today. But it was it was a it was a time of um, lots of different subcultures. I mean, you 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 at that time. So we're talking about summer of '78. With, you know, you had punks, you had Grebos, you had rockers, uh, you had skinheads, uh, you had mods uh, and soul boys, and and also there was another thing called casuals. And that's what, in my opinion, that was probably the casuals were the last youth culture this country's produced, really, because everything's so homogenised now and snow snapped up, it doesn't get a t time to grow. I mean, our scene, our scene grew out of really out of the mod scene of the revival mod scene grew out of punk, and we was doing you know within a couple of years we was doing our own fanzines, putting on our own club nights. We we had no choice. There weren't there weren't no Spotify. There weren't no YouTube. Uh, we had to find our own clothes. I mean, we were lucky in the East End because we had lots and lots and lots of old Jewish tailors and and old old shops that still had old dead stock and we used, used to wherever a job we was all work mostly working on building sites wherever we was working on a job we'd go and find a local old man shop and go in there and you know raid it really you know we'd you know nick what we could and buy what we could <laughs> it was um it was one we used to go called called leeches down a uh, commercial street and it was massive it's like triple fronted and it had everything in there was from the 60s but what they used to have, they, they had the old couple that ran it used to sit out the back watching racing all afternoon. So if you went in the afternoon, you could open the door quietly. And what happened, if you trod in the, on, the door, on, the, on the mat, the bell went off and it went ding, ding, to alert them that there's someone in the shop. So we just used to jump over the thing, nick something, put it under our coats or store it on our scooters and then go in and go, oh, you got any... F oh, all the best stuff was all in boxes out the back and all that. But, you know, we just used to go in, nick something and then buy something, which I think was like buy one, get one free. But, you know, originally. But um, it, it, was, it, was, it was tough. And, I mean, it was, it was violent. I mean, that's the thing. We, you know, I've, worked, I've worked, spent quite a lot of time working in the youth service and you know, all this stabbings and all that you hear about in the news. I mean, that was every week, especially going football, every week someone would get st sliced or stabbed or bottled or something. You know what I mean? It, and, and that weren't just football. It was if you was going to a gig, you could get, if you was going to Camden Town, the Camden Skins, you, you, I mean, it was just like murders. Every time you went there, it was like fights with skinheads. And they became our like from the 60s mods and rockers and in the 70s we had mods and skinheads and we didn't like them they were nf for a start and the other thing they were horrible and bullies and you know and we just got we all sort of come together as a, a, a group and 
we just started running events and going safety in numbers. So everywhere we went, we'd be mob handed. And the similar thing was at football. And through this, um, I mean, in I think it was August 79, uh, a film called Quadrophenia came out, um, which this thing I'd been into for just over a year, me and a couple of my mates, just exploded. All of a sudden, everyone in all the youngest, all the year behind us, the two years behind us, they were all wearing parkas and button down shirts and Fred Perry's and all that. And it was like all my mates blew out. And uh, they, they started to turn casual. And at the time, casual was um, uh, what uh, a, a sort of another subgenre of teenagers that were into dub reggae and were basically took their clothing inspiration from like people like Gregory Isaacs and Bob Marley. So they'd wear tight farrers, Adidas trainers, and gabiches, and have slightly longer hair, which I think probably came from, from up north. At the time of 79, everyone just had grown out crops, you know, and there was a lot of like college boy haircuts with the partings and all that. Um, up north, you had in Leeds, you had a group called the Perry Boys, because they all wore Fred Perry's, which were deemed up north to be expensive. I had my clothing, they weren't compared to like, the costs and things like that, but uh, they, they were another, another group. So this scene started to spread and it came from the terraces and it comes back to what I was saying earlier. It comes from having a, a massive amount of teenagers all in one place all vying for positions and all vying for hierarchy within within their peer group and looking at what how to move forward and how to be different, slightly different. Um, I remember seeing, I was coming back from the West End and uh, I see my, my mate's little brother on the train and um, he, he had a, a Sergio Ciccini top, which was a very expensive designer sports brand. Italian designer sports brand and he was a plasterer, I was a plumber and he was a plasterer and uh, it was covered in plaster and I went, fucking hell Stu, what are you doing wearing that? It's like uh, 70 quid and, and it really was and 70 pound was like a week's wages basically so like 500 quid, quid top and um, he, I went, what are you doing wearing that? Like? And he went, well he goes, uh, all the northerners have started wearing them and <laughs> And it's, it's how the, the, so how that culture, how these cultures develop is that you've got this up in, I, I, I remember hearing this from a 60s mod and it's, it, it's quite, quite relevant to what we're talking about today. He said to me, he went to Cecil G in, um, in the Strand, which was uh, synonymous in the 60s for uh, importing shirts, importing American button downs and things like that. And he was going to take the bird out or he was going to do something special. And he said, uh, he went in and he bought, uh, he bought this shirt and he was a large. And he also bought the medium and the small. And he said, how many of them you got? He said, we just got the three. We've only got a small, medium and large. And he, he bought all three of them. The geezer behind the desk, he said, why are you buying all three of them? He goes, don't want no one else wearing it. And and that's what you don't as a teenager. You want to have that. You want to have that identity. You want to. You want to be not like everyone else. You want to be different, and you want to stand out from the crowd. And you don't want to be part of the norm. And you don't want to be part of what people expect. And it and it and it's part of it. And it's. I look. Um. I I I did a book. I uh, helped out with a book once, and uh, Bobby Gillespie, from who we were just talking about earlier, which reminded me of this quote. He said to me, oh, the f even though Primal Scream are not mods or anything like that, he said, oh, the great thing about mods, you're anarchists in suits. Uh, and, and that was it. We were, you know, that sort of summed it up. We were, we were different. We were going out. We would, we would go into um, bars and, uh, and clubs and we'd go, oh, we want to put on a jazz night or something respectable. We'd go in a suit and we'd look and to all intents and purposes, if we walked in there and we went, we want to do a mod night, we'd been shown the door, especially in the West End. But we, we could go in and go, oh, we want to do a jazz night, and that's all respectable, and we'd turn up. But as long as they were taking money and there was no trouble, they was all right. I mean, most of them, there was trouble. But 
Um, yeah, so we, we'd go, we'd do our own clubs, put our own things on, and we ended up with uh, doing our own bands, putting our own nights on, and all of, all of this was just out of nothing. It was like a cottage industry, and it still affects c culture today. And going right back to what Lucas was talking about, you know, uh, you know the, 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 the mod scene of the 60s has influenced culture right the way through. And coming back to, you know, this casual culture, which, uh, in my opinion, was like the last teen culture, because Acid House was run by a load of gangsters my age. Well, a load of mates, sorry. <laughs> but um, uh, it, it, it was like the Acid House scene was a lot... The audience were young, but the people running it were, like, all in their 20s and 30s. So it weren't really a teenage culture. But the, the, these... The... the the way we the way we did stuff and the the way we the way we 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 carried on was to say well fuck you we can do this and how this developed at football was because by the the sort of height of football hooligan days sort of 81 82 83 that sort of early 80s when we were the folk devil you know we were the moral panic the folk devil and Thatcher was after us and all that you, we was get, we was going around the country taking liberties because we we looked like golfers, you know what I mean. Most of our firm were walking around in slacks, nice slip-on shoes, nice hair, uh, Pringle jumpers, or you know Ralph Ralph Lauren or Burberry, and we were going into town on a inner city train and we were turning up eight o'clock in the nine o'clock in the morning in manchester and the old bill we would just walk straight past them because all the old bill were looking for and all everyone else was looking for was skinheads in great big dr martin boots and uh, and it's that and, and you get that anarchy from that as well we were like loony i mean they were lo they they were lunatics <laughs> But, you know, I mean, we was like going to places, you know, 500 kids just steaming in and just taking liberties and getting away with it. And then, of course, you know, when it all, you know, got dispersed by the police, they're looking for hooligans. And their image of a hooligan was a skinhead in big Dr. Martin boots with skin tight jeans, bleached and skin tight top and braces. And this gets gayer and gayer as the years go on. But it, it was it was that was th what they were looking for, and we uh, the, the the football culture at the time was the opposite of that. It was five hundred pound jackets and three hundred pound trainers and all things like that, because it's we were looking once again as a culture we were looking for to be different and and to be at, at dressing everyone else, and it's always about that thing looking better than them. Even though we were all working class, we all wanted to look better than them. And I think that sort of sums up youth culture in general. I was going to say, Bob, as well, what was really important to, um, to realise is that every decent subculture out there that really does care about the way they look and constantly evolves, everybody who I've ever met has always said there was only 80 of that type of person around at a time. So uh, I know that, that, Ian Hingle yeah, is a good friend. Yeah, that, of ours. Go, that goes back to all the great social movements. So I, I, I studied this at uni, and you go back to uh, the new romanticism of uh, the 17th century and all that, and they, they and, uh, and the um, uh, Bo Brummel and all that that sort of fops look and all that. All these different cultural movements were all a core group of about the same number of about 70 or 80 and i spoke to quite a you know quite a high up person in swing the 60s passed away now philip townsend and he said uh, you know he said I, I wasn't the leader of the swing in 60s but i was certainly part of it and he was one of that you know photographer and all that and all these different cultural movements that have moved things forward throughout british culture have all been a small core group of about the same number of about 70 or 80 people Thank <laughs> you.